work. So what I'm going to cover largely is the anatomy relating to the radial head, posterior interosseous nerve, and the approaches to the elbow, and talk about some surgical techniques. I think uh, some of the important landmarks to remember, because uh, very often as surgeons, when we are approaching the lateral part of the elbow, we are worried about the posterior interosseous nerve. We are not sure how far proximal, how far distal we can go. So it's important to start off with your central point at the lateral epicondyle and remember these important relationships. So when you look at the lateral epicondyle here, right there, and you look at the first point where the posterior interosseous nerve touches the radius, that distance is about five centimeters away. So whenever you're exposing the radial head, you can very confidently cut for at least four centimeters before you start worrying about the radial nerve, which will come around five and a half centimeters. Where it is right on the middle of the radius, it's six centimeters and seven centimeters where it exits the supinator muscle to go to the forearm. So this is an important relationship to remember. So if you're ever worried, you can make sure as long as you are just over about four centimeters, you will be safe. If you pronate the forearm, the nerve will move away from you. If you supinate the forearm, the nerve will move in the area of danger. So you want to make sure the forearm is pronated as you can see in the picture above. Now, this picture shows you proximally where the radial nerve exits from the lateral intermuscular septum compared to the lateral epicondyle. So here, if you look here, you can see that the radius is about, the radial nerve is about eight centimeters proximal, right there. And further up it's nine centimeters and then 10 centimeters. So here, if you go to the point where it exits the intermuscular septum, you can be as far as eight centimeters proximal. So if you want a wide exposure of the radius, you can make an incision all the way from here to here. Basically, you can be sir, eight centimeters above to about sir, five centimeters cur below. Sir, sir, your cursor is not moving That's probably. Sir. Okay. Can you see my marker moving at all or not? No, 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 sir. It's the slide is freeze because you have, you have selected a window uh, okay. for sharing. Select the desktop so that you can uh, share it. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Uh, have, uh, that, that, that is the basic technical yeah. difficulty. Let me try that again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Try to share the screen, not the PowerPoint. Yes. Oh, then gotcha. Are, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understand. Okay. So let's share the screen. Yes. Now it is okay. Now it's now better? Now you can see. Yeah. Now move the cursor. Now move the cursor. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah, okay. okay, okay. So I can start here again. I'll yeah. just clear these. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be a good revision for us also. <laughs> so you start after the first slide. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we'll talk about the anatomy and the techniques, surgical technique for radial head replacement. So this is the first part of the critical anatomy and we base our whole dissection on the lateral epicondyle. So what we know from this paper by Suki Gawa in the shoulder elbow journal is, I'll just delete these marks that I've made before here. Okay, so when you look at the lateral epicondyle, our main concern when we are approaching the radius proximally is we are worried about cutting the radial or the posterior interosseous nerve where it crosses the radius through the supinator muscle. So the, safe, the first point where it comes to the anterior margin of the radius is about six centimeters from the lateral epicondyle. So as long as we cut from the lateral epicondyle five centimeters distally, 
you don't have to worry about the nerve. As you go further, seven centimeters, the nerve leaves the radius and goes into the forearm. Most importantly, if your forearm is pronated, your nerve will move away from your zone of dissection. So important, as you can see in the picture above here, to keep the forearm pronated during your approach to the radial head if you're doing a lateral approach from here. Now we're looking at the relationship of the radial nerve proximal in the arm compared with where uh, the lateral epicondyle is. So from the lateral epicondyle, so the radial nerve first enters the lateral intermuscular septum here, and that is 10 centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle. Or if you look at anybody's humerus, it's the middle third, lower third junction of the arm. That's where the radial nerve enters. A point, if you're ever putting an external fixator on the humerus and across the elbow, you do not want to put your fixator here. You have to put it right here at the deltoid insertion. That is a safe point. The other point you want to put it is on the ulna here, but don't put a fixator here because you have a high risk of damaging the radial nerve. As, you, as the radial nerve comes in front under the brachialis muscle, between the brachioradialis and brachialis, this point is eight centimeters proximal to lateral epicondyle. So what we have learned is if you're going to open the elbow, you can go as much as about eight centimeters there and as down as five centimeters here, and you can elevate extensor carpi radialis longus, you can elevate the brachioradialis, and you get a fantastic view of the entire anterior aspect of the elbow. This is an excellent approach for radial head fractures, for coronoid fractures, and for anterior capsular release in cases of elbow joint contracture. So it's important to remember these landmarks relating to the lateral epicondyle. As you can see here, if you make a window from three centimeters to four and a half centimeters, you can get a view all the way right up to the ulnar coronoid process. And this is where you can fix this down in a terrible triad. You can fix the coronoid from the lateral approach. So this is an approach that you should be very familiar with when you're doing all elbow surgery. Here is a video showing the dissection. So the arm is over here. The forearm is in this direction. Here's the lateral epicondyle. You can see the radial head right there. And we've opened the supinator muscle to show the posterior introsseous nerve as it's entering and winding around the radius. So here you can see the posterior introsseous nerve right there. When you pronate, the nerve goes out of the way, so it's very safe. When you supinate, the nerve comes right in the area of your dissection, so it's at a higher risk of being damaged. So very important, keep the forearm pronated as you do your surgery on the proximal radius. So with the forearm pronated, you can cut very safely four centimeters down from the lateral epicondyle, and you can get a good exposure of the radius head, the radial neck, all the way up to the biceps insertion at the tuberosity of the radius. So you can very safely expose the radius and do all your surgery over there. Now, when you look at it from the anterior aspect, this is just to show the anterior aspect of the elbow. That's the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve that we're moving away. This is the biceps tendon that we are holding in the forceps. And there's the posterior introsseous nerve. When you supinate, when you're looking from the anterior aspect, when you supinate, 
the radial nerve moves away or the posterior interosseous moves away. When you pronate, the nerve comes into view. So when you're operating on the anterior aspect of the forearm, for example, doing a biceps tendon repair, this is a biceps tendon. This is your posterior interosseous nerve. If you supinate the forearm, the nerve will move out of the way. If you pronate it, the nerve will be at risk. I'll just show that video again so you can see it. That's the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, which you're pulling away. There's the posterior interosseous nerve. Biceps tendon. When you pronate, the nerve comes right near the biceps tendon and the anterior radius. When you supinate, they move away and you can make your Henry approach with the forearm supinated right there. If I have a radial head and neck fracture extending into the shaft, I will do an anterior approach. If I have to approach only the radial head and neck, I will do the approach, the Thompson approach or the direct lateral approach that I just showed you in the previous slide. We all know the Mason classification where the fracture first type is where it's non-displaced and second type is the displaced fracture. Third is where the fracture is comminuted. And the fourth is any association with elbow dislocation. Most of the time when we are operating on a distal radius fracture is usually this one and this one. For most patients between these two groups, we decide whether they need any kind of intervention based on the range of motion. Bye, hello, sir. Uh, oh. Range of motion after we do an aspiration of the elbow. So when the patient comes to emergency room, if they have an isolated radial head fracture, they get a aspiration under local anesthesia infiltration into the posterior triangle of the elbow through the anconeous muscle. We check the range of motion. If there is no block, to forearm rotation, the patient is given a sling and allowed early active range of motion because the concern is they will get a flexion contracture. If they have a block to forearm rotation, then we will fix this fracture. If they don't have a block, they will move it. In the type three and the type four, in these two, we will generally do an elbow stabilization of which part of it will be radial head fracture fixation. Now, if the elbow is stable, you may consider primary excision of the radial head. However, you will need to repair any ligamentous injury if in an acutely injured elbow, you do a radial head excision because you may have risk of instability of the elbow. So the kind of radial head fracture you want to be most concerned about is the kind which has a coronoid fracture as you can see in the front here, and we'll discuss that in the terrible triad lecture. So generally speaking, we don't excise the radial head. The goal is to replace it. Now, every time you get a radial head fracture, it's important to remember that there may be a disruption of the introsseous membrane, and there may be a disruption of the distal radio ulnar joint. So very important to examine the patient clinically for pain over the distal radio ulnar joint, and to do an X-ray and see if they have an excessive radial shortening with ulna looking positive. That means they've had a tear in the introsseous membrane. Now, should we fix them or should we replace them? Now, in the, when we talk in the end about questions and answers, we can discuss whether they should all be fixed or not. But I think once you decide you're going to operate on them, generally speaking, if there's one or two pieces, and the bone quality is good. So if I'm dealing with an elderly osteoporotic patient with a dislocated elbow and radial head fracture, the bone quality is poor. So if I fix the radial head with screws, it's going to fall apart. I will do a primary replacement. However, in a young patient with good quality bone, we will fix the radial head with screws, usually headless screws, but you can even use little mini screws and bury the head. If there are multiple pieces, and you have to take the radial head out and assemble it on the back table. We used to do that. 
We don't do that anymore because when you put these back with the plate, they generally get very stiff. So typically in these cases, instead we will do a radial head replacement. Now, if you are doing an internal fixation of the radial head, the goal is to get back that radial head in its correct angle and correct height, correct height. The most important thing is a plate should be in the safe zone so it does not cause impingement against the sigmoid notch of the ulna as the radial head rotates on it. The safe zone important to remember if you're doing this operation is if you keep the forearm neutral. So the patient's forearm is neutral over there. It's 110 degrees arc from that neutral position. So once you have your forearm pronated, you've exposed the radial head, you're putting a plate on, then you put the forearm in a neutral position. And with the forearm in neutral position, if you can see where your plate is, you're generally safe. You don't want your plate too anterior, too far anterior or too far posterior. So that's a safe zone. And basically it's right there where you're looking at it. So here is an example of a patient and they've got a radial head fracture. We tend to do CT scans for these patients. Now this patient has a radial head fracture and you can see this fragment over here anteriorly on the CT scan. You realize it's often very hard to look at it on a plain X-ray. What you also realize is there's impaction of the rest of the radius down there. So we've done a lateral approach. Now in this case, there was an associated elbow dislocation. So when you do the lateral approach, the lateral collateral ligament, you'll often find it already detached. So that makes your exposure much easier. You can fix the radial head and then repair the lateral collateral ligament as you exit. And then you can start mobilization after soft tissue healing in about 10 days time. And that's where the fracture has healed. Now this patient has a dislocation of the elbow. It looks like a pure posterior lateral dislocation. This is an example of why it is important to get an X-ray after every reduction. And now you can see when he's had the reduction there that that radial head is dislocated. So he clearly had a non-displaced radial head fracture there or radial neck fracture. And now after reduction, the radial head has come off. Now in this case, it's quite clear that the radial head will contribute to the stability of the elbow. So this in my mind would be an indication where you would fix that radial head. If you excise the head, you can. If you excise the radial head, you would have to repair the ligament on this side, on the medial side, because the mechanism is a valgus injury where this opens up and the radial head breaks. Now in this patient, this was much more comminuted than we thought. So we had to put a plate and headless screws to get stability on that radial head. The reason we did not do a replacement on this patient, this, this patient was only in his 20s. And so we preferred or we tried to preserve the radial head mainly because of age. If he was uh, a little bit older, we would have uh, put a radial head implant, which has less risk of stiffness. When you put so much metal work on the radial head, there's a higher risk of it getting stiff. This patient fortunately uh, did not have any issues and he went on to heal and did not need radial head excision or soft tissue release. Now this is another example of quite a severe elbow injury. The elbow is dislocated. When you look at the x-rays, you realize that there is something going on there. It's hard to see what other fragments there are, but you realize that with this, you want to do a reduction and then you want to get a CT scan after reduction to check which fragments are going where. So now we've done our reduction and we can see that there's a radial head fracture here. So when we do our CT scan now, what we realize is there's a small piece of what is the anterior aspect of the coronoid. There's a radial head fracture and there was an elbow dislocation. So this again falls into that criteria of terrible triad injury uh, where the elbow is gonna be very unstable. The net connection is unstable. 
So what's interesting is when you open the skin, you can see how the lateral collateral ligament and part of the common extensor origin is already torn off. We have done nothing. We have literally opened the skin, cut the superficial fascia, and the whole collateral ligament, common extensor origin, just comes right off the bone. And what we are doing now is developing a true lateral incision. So we're not doing the cocker approach anymore, which is posteriorly over here. We don't want to do the cocker approach because the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is attaching over here. And that is an important stabilizer that cradles the radial head. So it's better to do an anterior approach, go through the collateral ligament proper, and then repair that back to bone. But do not go posteriorly because this will destabilize the elbow even more and is hard to repair. So that's the whole posterior shell and the posterior lateral ulnar collateral ligament is all peeled off from the, pro from the distal humerus proximally. And you can see how the elbow subluxates posteriorly the moment we've increased our exposure. So making sure we are splitting that common extensor origin over there. Here's the capitellum right there. There's the radial head, it's dislocated posteriorly. And you can see the multiple fragments of the radial head that are in the dislocated position. So what we do first is retrieve all the fragments of the radial head. Now it's important to retrieve and assemble the fragments because you have to get a measurement of what size of radial head to use. Now, generally speaking, and as it always seems to happen, the radial head will usually fall between two sizes. If you're in a doubt, choose the slightly smaller size. So in this case, we chose the 22 millimeters. If you're not sure, you can put the radial head on the C-arm and you can do an X-ray of your implants. So these are the trial implants and we make sure we choose the correct size. So important, when you do your first X-ray, you want to make sure with the trial in place that you have this nice smooth curvature of the radial head lining up with the proximal ulna. The reason never get a good x-ray ever again. So the best x-ray you get is the x-ray on the operating table at the time of surgery. To repair the coronoid first, because we're getting access through the hole of the, where the radial head has been excised. So now we are, there's a fragment of coronoid that we can put back. Notice the elbow is still subluxated posteriorly. That's subluxated posteriorly. Now it's reduced, okay? So you can see it's quite a clear view. Now we have to suture this piece back to the front of the coronoid. And so we'll be putting some pull-through sutures to secure it down. Now we put the pull-through sutures, but we haven't tied them yet. Here is a radial head replacement in place. I am putting an instrument across to make sure that my radial head lines up with the trochlear notch of the ulna so that there is no protrusion or what we call overstuffing of the elbow. If the radial head is very prominent, patient will get a lot of pain and very quickly will get wear of the capitellum. So this is the trial implant in place. Now this, this radial head is made by Acumed and it comes in different neck sizes. So we can choose the neck size based on getting this head correct length across the ulna. So you get a smooth, it almost looks like a seagull that's flying in the distance. So that's what it should look like. And this is the final implant that you can see over here. And there's the implant should line up perfectly with the center of the capitellum so you know that your radial head is not subluxated posteriorly when you're finished the operation. So this is the trial X-ray and this is the final X-ray. So this is with the Acumet system, you have the advantage that you can uh, put your radial head in place and you can put a feeler and you can choose the correct length of the neck that you will put in there. So you get the correct placement of that radial head uh, into the get the uh, elbow stable. So we are putting this in there. We are putting different size feeler. 
so we can determine what neck of radial, uh, what height of the radial neck in the implant should be used. There's a lot of choices there. So you choose the correct collar size. Now the Acumed implant is not a perfect circle. It's made anatomically like the radius. So it's slightly eccentric because if you look at the radial head, it's slightly oval. It's not a perfect circle. So because it's not a perfect circle and it's oval, the implant comes with a mark on it. That mark should point to Lister's tubercle. So when we impact it and we ream and get a tight fit, this lateral line should point to Lister's tubercle and that resembles the normal elliptical shape of the radial head. So this is the trial in place. We put the trial in place, check the stability, and then we put in, we assemble the head and the shaft together. It's a modular implant. And then we impact it into the radial neck. Now you notice I've got my sutures ready to tie the coronoid back, but I will not tie it until the end. So I put my anchor, I put an anchor here into the coronoid. I put my radial head in first with the elbow still dislocated. Can you see that? So there's the capitellum, there's the radial head. The elbow is still dislocated because I need it dislocated so I can impact the radial implant into place. Once it's fully inserted, then we can reduce that, tie the coronoid, reduce the radial head, and now repair the lateral collateral ligament back in place. Common extensor origin repaired back, lateral collateral ligament repaired back, and all the ligaments repaired back over here. And on the table, the elbow should have full range of motion and should be stable. If it is unstable, in spite of doing all this, then you have two options. You can put an external fixator or you can open medially and repair the medial collateral ligament. Usually, if you repair the coronoid and replace the radial head, that should be an adequate stable fixation. So that's what the patient looks like three months later. You can see there's nice, uh, nice tight fit of that radial head and a good position of the radial head relating to the capitellum. And there's a congruent ulna there. As I said, you can never get a good full straight X-ray of the elbow. So you will, it always looks like it's a bit overstuffed, but that's because the elbow has a slight flexion contracture. Now, there used to be a concept and you will be familiar that there's two types of radial head. There's a radial head made by Wright Medical, which is a smooth implant. And it actually is not a tight fit in the radius and it can freely rotate. The problem with these implants, they cause pain because the radial implant knocks around in the radius. It's like you get anterior thigh pain with a loose femur with the total hip. You get pain and you get forearm pain in a loose radial head, which is why now we tend to do a tight fit radial head implant like this, which we ream and do a tight fit into the radius so that they don't get that pain. Now, if you don't have implants like this available, you can use any kind of metallic spacer and you may have to remove it three months later, six months later when it gives pain because by then your elbow ligaments have healed. So if you don't have a modular implant, you only have a one size implant, you can use that, but just be prepared to remove it three to six months later if it becomes symptomatic. So we now believe that it's useful to have a radial head that has an anatomical shape so it should not be a perfect circle, but it should be slightly ovoid like the normal radial head. It should be correctly orientated, which is why that implant has a line. So it's got its correct axis and it should be positioned at the right height. And it should be rigidly fixed for good bone in growth. And obviously you need some good instrumentation. So this is just taking us through the concept how the radius head is like a cam. You can see, there's a perfect circle, but the radial head is not a perfect circle. And that slightly oval part points to where the Lister's tubercle is. And this is what happens if you put your radial head too tight and too large a radial head, you will get erosion of the capitellum, but the treatment is simple. You simply take out the implant.
and also radial head replacement and some of the concepts. When we get to discussion, we can talk about when you will replace it, or if you have some case examples, we can look at which ones get a replacement and which ones could be excised. Thank you, Dr.